Um, I'm Florian Bobaru from Mechanical and Materials Engineering in Nebraska. And I will talk about these um, very dynamic models, fracture and damage, um, and some fast computations that you can do with these. Uh, peridynamics, uh, peri in Greek means nearby. Um, so it's a non-local dynamics that, uh, that I'll discuss. And I will start uh, with the, the end. So these are some of the simulations you can now do with this code. It's a MATLAB code. Uh, this thing, if you run it on a laptop, it's a three-dimensional dynamic brittle fracture. It runs in less than an hour. If you have a GPU, it may be 10 minutes or so. This is corrosion, pitting corrosion. This is the symbol of uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln. If you, <laughs> I hope they coat this so it doesn't corrode, like, like you see here. Uh, and then you saw uniform corrosion was dissolving here. And we can even run, this is hundreds of pits. This is a centimeter scale now. Uh, these ones are micros, tens of microns, hundreds of microns. Uh, but um, related to the, the, the scale picture that you saw yesterday's talks and even today's talks, right, from the, the quantum to the airplane size, uh, what we will show today is some models that can be used from the micro scale uh, even some dislocation dynamics, uh, I'll show a short example, um, to the airplane scale, more or less. So uh, I would first like also to acknowledge, because uh, all of this work has been done with many, many contributors here. Uh, Tiguan Chen, who is now a professor at Huazhong University of Science and Technology in China, was a former postdoc of mine, and of course the funding agencies. Um, I will focus on... Uh, First, explaining why non-locality. And yesterday, we saw a talk at the completely different scale, but uh, that used some non-local um, non-locality. How non-locality is useful when modeling damage and failure. And by damage, I will um, refer to not only fracture, but also even corrosion damage, like you saw there, dissolution. To me, that's uh, uh, damaging the material. And we will try to embed some microscale mechanisms, sometimes, or behavior into continuum level models. Peridynamics is a continuum model. Um, and show examples in brittle fracture, fragmentation. Uh, you saw the one on corrosion. I don't have time here to, to discuss. Uh, we've uh, covered the galvanic corrosion as well, crevice corrosion, uh, transgranular corrosion, um, and validated all of those cases with, with the experiments uh, quite extensively. Um, maybe I'll show a, a short example on ductile failure and this uh, dislocation, uh, discrete dislocation dynamics, uh, where we have interactions of, of dislocations with a growing crack, and we'll see what that leads to. Uh, and then towards the end, I will show, I'll come back to the, the simulations that you saw at the beginning here, uh, using this fast convolution-based method uh, for these relatively expensive non-local models. They tend to be more expensive than local models, so that's why we're really happy to come up with something that works a little faster. Now, um, why has modeling of crack and damage uh, growth uh, has been a, a really a challenging uh, task for, for many, many decades? Uh, I try to argue here a little bit. Uh, these are methods that are trying to um, use the classical fracture mechanics theory, finite elements. But then a crack, let's say, if it has to develop, will have to follow the, the path between elements. Of course, you can try extended finite element methods where you uh, can cut through the elements, but still the, you have to follow the crack path with some function um, and, and keep track of where it is. Phase field models um, re rely on using this uh, kind of a scalar damage parameter uh, that's uh, one or zero on the crack region. The, the crack this time is going to be a fat crack, so it has a certain length scale, like uh, Lev was mentioning in the morning. Um, um, but again, is damage really a scalar um, or even a tensor? And I argue that uh, maybe even more complicated. There's, of course, uh, discrete element methods or other particle time methods where you have a certain number of bonds, springs, let's say, connecting various particles, and then as... Uh, and one of them is trained beyond a certain critical value. It fails. Uh, that leads to a cascading effect of, of, uh, of cracks uh, growing. But uh, here you, you sort of are limited to certain directions in which you can break these bonds. Well, peridynamics being a, a continuum model and with this mesh rediscretization that I'm kind of uh, highlighting here, 
you can split the domain in uh, as many points as you want. You have this non-local length scale, and then if a crack has to grow here, uh, these bonds, one of them will eventually be strained beyond a certain value and, um, and then break, leading to nearby ones also being, uh, having to take over that load, carry over that load, and uh, continue to break, which will then create a crack path, or not. We could create a, a, uh, a diffuse damage type uh, uh, behavior. Uh, and why uh, this is kind of better than this, it's because you can take this uh, discretization size to zero, so then you have an infinite number of bonds in all directions, uh, allowing you to develop this damage in the way it needs to, to do. And there's many examples, uh, especially in dynamic brittle fracture, where the uh, fracture surfaces are so complicated, it's hard to track them or, or to, um, to capture them with uh, anything that's really constraining you from reaching that. So what I'm trying to say is that sometimes our modeling techniques are not able to match the physics of the problem and uh, put around these mathematical constraints or, or geometrical constraints or, or numerical constraints that um, are just gonna take us on a, on a different path than where the system needs to evolve. And especially for dynamic problems, if you take the wrong step at one time, everything after that will be wrong, more or less. Um, so what is uh, peridynamics? Uh, Stuart Silling. Sorry, uh, can I ask him this? Do you yeah. want to qualify this by saying for a chaotic dynamic system? Uh, Surely this is not true for all dynamic systems, right? Otherwise we couldn't do numerical simulations. Right. I qualify that, yes. <laughs> but uh, on average, I'm, I think I'm, I'm OK here. <laughs> right? No? OK. Um, so peridynamics was introduced as a reformulation of um, elasticity theory for discontinuities and long range forces. Uh, so the difference compared to the classical uh, equations of motion for continuum mechanics is that we replace the term that causes trouble if you try to model uh, problems where you have discontinuities, like cracks. So instead of a divergence of stress tensor that you would normally find there uh, in you know, continuum mechanics, you replace this with an integral of forces. And these forces, uh, you see, depend on the relative displacements uh, and relative positions of, of the points uh, over a certain region. We call this the horizon, paradigm horizon. Uh, and this is a kind of a key point. The fact that you eliminate uh, spatial derivatives from your model is going to help you treat discontinuities that can pop uh, through here. Because then, um, uh, really, uh, mathematics works well. And um, you can uh, uh, actually have this damage quantity as well, like I mentioned before, by losing these bonds. In this case, that damage is not a scalar, it's not even a tensor, it's... Uh, how many bonds and in which directions have you lost those bonds? Now, when I plot the damage maps, you'll see just the this, uh, quantity that I plot is just a number, a scalar, uh, counting how many bonds I lost relative to with how many I started. But that's just a, a, a quantity that I, I like to, to use for plotting. The damage itself, the way it evolves, it's um, basically coming back to this, right? It's, um, it counts. Uh, the, the number, but also what matters is the direction of which, in which these bonds are breaking. And there's an infinite number of di possible directions here because it's a continuous model. So it's kind of a nonlinear mapping uh, is not even a tensor of the damage in paradynamics. Of course, there's been non-local theories over the years, uh, many decades ago, and again, by Jean. Um, but those theories, they still have uh, the strains. So you have derivatives of this, and that's when you have uh, get into trouble if you try to model fracture. Uh, Kooning has a, a, a book, uh, but there's no damage in, that, in those models. Fractional derivatives uh, are, can be seen as particular cases of paradigmic models, uh, if you want to look at them that way. Um, I have a question. So does this F that you have, does it somehow inherit the, uh, the symmetries of, a, let's say, underlying crystal uh, material yes. or something? Yes. So this is basically the constitutive law is in here. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, this is kind of the, uh, a nice trend to see the number of papers published on peridynamic topics uh, um, counted by these authors. I think they stopped at 2019, but I think the trend continues. Uh, as they say, you know, it's going to the moon, right? Um, so I'll so show, start with some examples in dynamic fraction fragmentation. 
like I said before, if you uh, look at the experiments, what uh, one sees is that um, uh, crack branching, for instance, happens um, when uh, there's a certain critical stress intensity factor uh, reached, and uh, after branching, uh, the, uh, the crack propagates with about the same velocity. There's no drop in half, uh, which is uh, the case predicted by the classical fracture uh, theories. Uh, and what you also notice is this um, uh, process zone just before fracture, you kind of expand that process zone and then it, it reduces uh, once it branched, okay? So uh, here's some periodynamic simulations of these uh, of branching. You, you load the crack surface here. Uh, experiments can do that uh, with a pulse, with a sudden pulse. Uh, this was a case when you saw branching because of waves reflecting from the sample boundaries. But in this case, I pull a little harder, so the, the branching happens before it's already branched here, and then when the waves come back, you see it's already you know, growing branched. Uh, it allows you to uh, look a little more detail of how this process at the continuum level happens, why branching happens in a homogeneous isotropic material like glass, let's say, or PMMA. Uh, this is when you, uh, I was looking at the crack tip uh, uh, from the previous picture, right? I load the crack surfaces there, and these are just the nodes I compute around that region. The color shows me uh, the, this damage index, how many uh, bonds I lost. If it's red, you lost about half of them, so it tells you there's a crack here. Um, and if you don't pull too hard, the, the crack grows straight. Interestingly, the material in front of the crack tip moves towards the advancing crack. So if you pull harder, it's gonna move harder, and that's gonna eventually, um, with all of these waves, you see kind of a relay wave bouncing off and off, uh, uh, on and off from the, from the uh, uncracked region here, uh, is gonna send some energy kind of into the banks of the crack, and that's when you start to see damage of nodes that are a little not just you know, relatively close to the crack surface in that horizon region, but um, at a little distance. And once you've uh, you know, grown that, um, and because of the material in front of the crack tip was moving against you, you, you move sideways and you, you branch. So that's kind of the, uh, uh, the, the picture of that movie, right? So then you, you find that bonds along these directions are gonna be stretched beyond their uh, critical value that you can calibrate to the fracture energy of, of a material, and then you, you're branched at this point, yes. And then the, material in front of the crack tip is now relaxed. There's no reason for it to, to grow that way. Um, that was one crack or a few branch cracks. So how can you model fragmentation? Just, you know, uh, general damage. Yes. Yes, the results depend on the constitutive flow F that you have in the model. Right, here this was brittle, uh, so linear and brittle. Glass follows pretty close to that at most temperatures room temperature. So, so the, the, the constitutive law is learned from data showing this, this cracks or? No, the constitutive law is, is uh, learned, so you just have to calibrate in this case the elasticity. So you just need the elasticity, the elastic constants, and uh, the fracture energy. So you do an experiment for the fracture energy. You don't, we don't, I don't rely here on, uh, on atomistic uh, level or any other data. Just plain experiments. Um, so if you have more cracks, damage of general type, uh, this is where periodynamics is really an umbrella that captures everything uh, uh, related to this type of damage. So here's a, an experiment uh, our colleagues at ARL did. This is a 10 centimeters by 10 centimeter sample. Uh, it's 0.3 centimeters, so three millimeters uh, thick glass. And there's a backing plate of polycarbonate. They use tape on the sides only, so there's nothing in between them. There's no glue or anything. But they put tape so then they, we can have the fragments and take a look at them. Uh, so they, they shoot this uh, steel projectile at 400 meters per, uh, per second or so. Uh, this is a strike face, and uh, I couldn't put these pieces back here, but they're coming from this crater on the back side, as you can see. Um, and here's our periodynamic simulation. Uh, this, the, this is the front face, the discretization nodes on the front face of that three-dimensional, relatively thin, but still three-dimensional. And this is the back face. You see the difference in damage. And there's a a whole host of types of cracks that grow. Uh, there's uh, circular cracks, uh, circumferential cracks, uh, radial cracks. There's cracks that grow from the edges. There's cracks that are parallel to the edges. Uh, there are these fine, really, we call them wispy cracks. And we have an explanation and a, a detailed explanation for all of these sets of cracks. Um, I'm not gonna 
be able to talk about all of them today, but I hope to, to say a few words about them. So this is the same thing, but uh, you see the backing plate as well here. That doesn't break. It's just the polycarbonate this, uh, you know, separates. We didn't use the tape on our uh, simulation that they use there, but uh, maybe it doesn't play a huge role. Um, so you see the, all of these uh, various types of cracks that were also observed in the experiment. Let me just focus on this particular cracks that here I'm only plotting the, the damage and I'm blanking the non-damaged materials in kind of a 3D uh, picture of this. Um, and uh, this would be the edge, right? The, the edge, uh, the right edge of the sample. And there's some crack initiating from there, some damage, and then looks like it's moving towards. So these are cracks that grow from the edges towards the, uh, even though I hit it uh, perpendicular, yeah? Eventually with these waves moving around, they grow that way. There's also even some fake branching. This one was uh, a, a crack growing from the edge, meeting a crack, a radial crack coming from the center. And uh, if you look post-mortem, you see, oh, this looks like a branch crack. That's not the branching type I showed you before when a crack splits, right? This is just a merging of two cracks, but it's hard to tell uh, if you didn't have a, you know, a fast camera to, to look at that experiment. So here's what happens if you look at uh, nodes kind of on the front surface, and I'm plotting the out-of-plane velocity vector for those, and the color there with some kind of damage that happens at each node. And, and you'll see that uh, this is the edge of the, the sample. This is kind of where it hit. There's this wave that uh, it folds over, and then it travels. And you see a crack here and another crack here growing. These are from the edge, more or less, or very close to the edge. Um, there's this Rayleigh wave uh, bouncing from the edge and then and travels along this. And then it meets with these um, primary waves, the shear waves coming from the center. That's where those cracks form, okay? Uh, so that's kind of the, the story, right? It folds on itself and then it meets these other incoming waves and then it creates, they reinforce each other and create these, these uh, locations uh, where you have uh, these cracks. So how do the experiments show? Because you can do fractography and tell us uh, from looking at the water lines on the crack surface, which direction were these cracks growing in the experiment? So our colleague, uh, uh, Jerry Wright, was at ARL at the time. He looked at these little cracks here, and he noticed, uh, so for this part, this is close to the top corner. This is the top corner. Um, there are some that grow from the edge to the, to the center, the ones kind of here and the bottoms here, these ones, from the edge to the center. But, uh, but there are some, these ones closer to the center, uh, they appeared in, in his uh, experimental, when he looked at the uh, surfaces, to grow from the surface to the edge. So that's kind of different from what we, we thought. You know, here in the simulation, these cracks were growing, all of them kind of from the edge to the center. Yeah? But then the, the reason uh, for this, uh, we believe, is because in the experiment they use tape. So these ones here are shot off because of the tape that absorbs some of that energy. Whereas these ones are not because they don't start right at the edge. They start a little inside, at least in our computations. So that's why they're gonna be okay. Uh, they're gonna still grow uh, uh, you know, this way in the experiment, even though there's some tape here, but the tape is far from where they grow. So uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting uh, feature that we, we could predict. Um, I used, in all of these simulations, I used a certain non-local interaction, this horizon size. But what is that? How can you determine it? Um, I'll try to explain this in a brittle fracture uh, example where the cracks is not driven by mechanical loading. I'm not pushing on or pulling on the material. I'm just uh, uh, thermally cooling it, uh, quenching it if you like. Uh, there's a, a thin glass plate uh, going through this uh, hot oven, so it's a hot temperature, and then it has a, a notch at the tip, at the base tip there, is a small notch, to let a crack uh, you know, grow from a specific location. That's the, the purpose of that. Um, and if you pull, push this, um, this plate slowly, very slowly, it's micrometers per second, um, at, at most millimeter per second, uh, into the cold water, and depending on a variety of things, what you see uh, is uh, this type of behavior, stray cracks, sometimes even no crack, the crack will not grow if it's too slow and the, the plate width is not large enough, but nothing happens. Uh, but you can get a straight crack or this undulating crack, a telephone cord for those of us who are of a certain age that remember that. Um, and it's, it's amazingly uh, constant period, period and amplitude. 
Uh, and these cracks grow slow, as slow as you push them in. Meet the micrometer per second in glass, right? You would expect things would explode, but that's not because uh, you're not dumping into the water, you're slowly uh, putting into the cold water. Uh, and you can actually even have these branching things, right? And then uh, have them oscillate and so on. Uh, however, uh, the uh, so-called T-stress criterion um, for crack stability is not really applicable here. There's a bunch of papers that show that uh, you, you have uh, this uh, oscillation in uh, you know, stress intensity factors, even in K2. Um, so um, it was a little hard to understand what's going on. But um, what we'll try to do is if a paradynamic model can uh, replicate this type of behavior, let's say this uh, phase diagram uh, between uh, uh, if you change the driving velocity, immersion velocity, and the plate width, relative to what type of cracks you're gonna see. Uh, oscillating ones, or a straight, or no propagation. And uh, you can vary temperature difference uh, as well versus the, the immersion speed. But we're gonna look at, at this particular one. So what is the physical uh, re uh, reason for this? I will explain it. Um, these are some computations that have been done over more than 20 years, and none of them, even a paradynamic one here, uh, um, th they're not really um, able to reproduce everything that you see here. Some things are seen, uh, but some other ones, uh, they're, they're really not. Uh, so we wanted to understand why that. So this, for instance, a phase field model, right, it gives you this, like I said, this, uh, right, if I, I'm not gonna say again. <laughs> the, the, uh, but, but this is a, a landscape of energy that has various minima that are not necessarily physical in a phase field model. And you get these nicely decorated uh, oscillations, but they're not seen uh, that much in experiment. You do see the branching ones though. So um, why can't we predict this too well, right? It's a, really a simple problem. A linear elastic and brittle fracture is glass. Uh, there's mostly a, just one crack. Uh, it's quasi-static. Maybe if you go to millimeter per second, it may have to do a dynamic solver there, but we're gonna stay in the micrometer per second immersion, so there shouldn't really be that much uh, dynamics there. Um, so let's see. Uh, what we tried is a uh, paradigm model for thermoelasticity, so I'm just gonna not solve for the temperature because the temperature is uh, pretty stable here. I think I skipped over this, but um, this is how the temperature across the, the, the this longitudinal direction of the plate changes from the oven to the bath, depending on the immersion speed. So you can actually uh, mimic a dynamic process that immersion speed by imposing a certain temperature profile across the gap, and then shifting that in time to, to have your crack propagate. Right? So if it's slower immersion, it's gonna be more or less flat linear here, or uh, if it's a little faster, it's gonna go with that velocity, uh, with that um, temperature profile depending on the velocity. So um, that's why I'm not gonna, I, I can solve this as a quasi-static problem uh, and just uh, put a uh, thermal expansion or contraction, really, because you put it in the cold water uh, coefficient there in, in the bonds. And uh, this is also critical, make sure um, that you put a fracture, critical fracture energy that's measured, again, this is not from atomistic or anything, just measured in experiments, they see a dependence, it's a, a drop of a factor of two or more in the fracture energy from uh, room temperature to um, you know, 120 degrees or so. So that's also important. And we're gonna input these effective um, presence of the immersion velocities by uh, different temperature profiles that will control how this thing shrinks. So this is um, some results we get. Depending on different immersion velocity, you get these different profiles, or different width, you get these different behaviors. The oscillating ones, and you see you can get really different than sinusoidal type, and you see some of that here as well. Um, this um, uh, frequency, right, the, the, the uh, lambda here over the width of the, of the plate, uh, it's in our simulation matches uh, what they measure as well, about 0.33 for when, it's, uh, when it oscillates, when it branches, of course, it's a different issue. Uh, obviously, you do have to start with that notch a little off-center there, otherwise, because of the symmetry of the computations, everything will be symmetric, you will not get anything other than a straight crack. Um, but that's okay, because in experiment, you're not gonna put that between the two atoms that are in the middle of your sample, right? that, that crack, you, you cannot do that, and this is an amorphous system anyway. So. 
um, some asymmetry, uh, that initial notch will always be present there. Uh, if you change the temperature gap, that's what you also see, right? Uh, lower temperature gap or more and more, uh, you get the branches, multiple branchings. Um, and this is where the tip of the crack relative to the moving of that uh, temperature field, right? So this is the hot, this is the cold side. And uh, in the experiments, they measure the, the, the tip of the crack for different uh, widths. Uh, it's pretty stable, so it doesn't, because you're doing it so slow, right? So the crack tip stays pretty close to the entrance in the oven. And you see how we line up with, with those uh, experimental data as well. Um, let's see if this plays. Right, so this is how the temperature moves. We're not solving here, we're kind of solving over a, a region that kind of slides or, or, or uh, this boundary uh, moves towards this. Uh, initially we don't solve over this region, right? But then um, you see how uh, if you change the width of the system, you get these uh, different behaviors. And coming to your question, right, what causes this? So the reason is that because of a little um, imbalance in the contraction force, these things will not be equilibrated perfectly, right? So one will, will have a stronger contraction than the other side. Um, so it's gonna pull the, the crack uh, either, if the, the imbalance is not too strong, it's just gonna, but enough to propagate the crack, it will stay straight. If it's a little too, and why would it be for a wider, um, wider plate stronger? It's because the contraction force uses longer, you know, more material. So of course it's gonna lead to a higher forces uh, that will start to pull the crack towards one side. Once it's pulled too much on one side, then the amount of material on this side is much less than here, so it's gonna be pulled back. So you have this nice winding path that's, uh, that's really <laughs> fascinating to look at. Uh, if you change the immersion speed as well, uh, you, you get these um, different behaviors, either oscillating or uh, higher amplitude oscillations. Um, if you, uh, and yes, so now <laughs> we looked at um, maybe an, another view of what causes uh, th this uh, oscillations in, in the crack path. Here I'm not plotting the temperature, the, the colors are actually the velocity vector magnitude at every point. I'm calling it velocity, it's like a fake time, because I'm doing quasi-static solutions, like I said. Um, but I take the difference between the displacements at, at different uh, um, states of, of solving that uh, quasi-static problem uh, before you, you translate your uh, thermal field, basically the temperature field, uh, to, the, to the right. Uh, and, and you see these, these are basically the, the streamlines of the velocity vector field. And uh, you see this hidden dynamics, really. Um, that uh, even these vortices that really control how, uh, how the crack is trying to, uh, to, to go, which direction it grows into. So have yes. you uh, studied the stability of this motion? So let's say you perturb from this uh, oscillating uh, solution and... We haven't, unfortunately, but I think it would be very interesting to, to see because uh, it looks like, uh, I don't know, hurricanes in a solid. <laughs> Uh, this is a quasi-static fracture. Uh, again, I, I want to emphasize that. Um, so, yes. So suppose you were to do this in elastodynamics, right? Uh, with dynamics. And because of the non-locality, so would you see something up front? I mean, sort of, you know, in dynamics, there is a finite speed of propagation of waves. So how does that interact with uh, this business of non-locality? Yeah, it shouldn't. Uh, I mean, all the, the previous examples were dynamic uh, examples, right? All of those were fully dynamic. Here, we, we just... So what, what happens? I mean, do you see an effect uh, uh, ahead of the crack tip in dynamics? If the horizon size is large, then you get a kind of a faster propagation speed of the wave. Yes. If it's small enough, right? And I'll get to the point, how, how do you choose the horizon in this case? Uh, for dynamics, you have to also connect that to a length scale if there is one that you can cor correlate to. Yeah. Um, so, but let me ba go back to this, right? So we wanted to see if we can capture this because this is really tough. You see here for the same uh, plate width, a smaller uh, driving velocity, you can get a straight crack propagation uh, and then you can go to no crack and then go back when you drive it faster to, cr uh, to, to straight crack. Or here from oscillating, it goes if you move faster to non-oscillating, and then again to oscillating. 
And this is very counterintuitive. I wouldn't have guessed this. If you didn't show me this picture, I would say, you know, that's not, doesn't make sense. Why would it do that, right? Uh, so um, how do we choose the horizon size here? Um, here's an idea. Uh, you have, these are the experimental curves from those separation lines. So I'm going to look at one point here uh, where I have a separation line for a certain uh, immersion speed and a plate width. And I'm going to choose a plate width that's a little higher and a, a plate width that's a little lower, let's say, for that immersion speed. And then try one horizon and see if I get uh, a, um, a uh, here I think it was oscillating, here and then uh, if I get a straight crack on the bottom. If not, I'll try to change my horizon to lower it and then try again. So we found one and this is what happens if you try to change the horizon for the same conditions. Here I'm not changing the conditions, just the, you know, the horizon size. Um, so the horizon, this normal quality is you're grabbing you know, more far away from where you're at. You kind of get a more energetic uh, behavior and then as you decrease this, you, you, uh, you kind of lose that. And here's the reason for this, right? So uh, imagine this is a, the, the crack that has to grow between these two sides that are not perfectly balanced. Like I said, you're not gonna be always uh, in perfect symmetry there. Um, now the paradynamic model has the horizon size, so any point in this region is losing bonds compared to the other ones, so we'll have some damage. It's gonna effectively feel uh, as a softer material there, right? You, you lost some damage, uh, so you lost some bonds, right? Uh, and uh, so, so you have this. Uh, so what counts in terms of the, the thermal strain, the contraction force, is this blue region. But depending on the horizon size, since these, fixed, uh, these sides are fixed, uh, as you decrease the horizon size, you're actually decreasing the imbalance between these forces, okay? So that's why here the imbalance is higher, you're gonna do uh, you know, more crazy stuff, you know, oscillate stronger. As you decrease you decrease that imbalance, so you're not gonna uh, get there, okay? And once we found that, then we try to use that horizon for the rest of this um, phase diagram. And that's what we ended up with, yes? But presumably, you know, the choice of horizon and uh, this f function you have should be, you know, there should be some microscopic uh, considerations. Yes, yeah. Than, uh, just yeah, yeah, we did this for simplicity here, right? I mean, if you have potentials, atomic potentials, that's beautiful. So is there like a way to derive to this from interatomic uh, potential somehow, you know, the... Uh, yeah, I think anything that was talked about yesterday, it's just fantastic, yeah. Um, so, the, oops, sorry. So these are the uh, separation lines from the experiment that I just put on this graph. And then these are about 100 simulations we did with different uh, plate velocities and different um, plate widths, okay? Um, and where we had a uh, uh, oscillating crack, we put a cross. Where we had a straight crack, we put a diamond. When we had a no crack growth, we put a, a uh, upside down triangle. And you see how, how these lie uh, almost on top of each other. So, um, this is really a predictive model for this behavior, fully, in, in detail, okay? So uh, that's what I want to emphasize here, that this, this secret dynamics that surprise us uh, quite a bit, uh, of quasi-static fracture, really. Now, uh, of course, you can do the dynamic problem, but I don't think you'll find, um, unless you move the, the crack faster, really faster, you know, tens of millimeters per second, then inertia may play a role there. Um, okay. So uh, with this, I could claim we can claim that uh, in, really in paradynamics cracks are not part of the uh, are part of the solution, not part of the problem, which was for, for many many decades uh, that was a problem. All right, um, we've done a lot of work uh, on uh, validated uh, cases for fracture in homogeneous and isotropic material like glass, uh, PMMA. We have uh, a paper now with we have two layers of PMMA, and depending on the, how you, you dynamically load that uh, advancing crack. A crack can run along the interface and then punch through the second layer. And we can capture that as well. But how about heterogeneous materials? How can you uh, solve those problems? Um, I'm gonna look at uh, several uh, cases. Um, some of them will do the explicit microstructure. That's kind of the easy thing to do, but it's the expensive thing to do, obviously. Uh, but then we'll try some kind of homogenization m models, but uh, the one that works okay for fracture. So I'll, I'll show uh, some of those examples. So here's the uh, case where we model the uh, exact microstructure. This is uh, impact on uh, an alon. Alon is aluminum oxide nitride. It's a 
transparent ceramic that uh, the army, I think, likes. Um, so they have an edge impact on this sample. The sample is about 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. Uh, I think a couple of centimeters thick. And what they notice is in Alon, the fracture is, um, it's kind of a combination of uh, transgranular and intergranular. So you have these uh, kind of grain boundaries you see here, very nice and flat. Uh, but these are conchoidal fracture surfaces that happen um, through the grain, through the crystal. Uh, compared to uh, some other uh, ceramics of similar type uh, that have uh, uh, only intergranular uh, fracture. So uh, this helped us to choose what fracture toughness we want to use for our uh, model. So we're going to do now explicit polycrystalline system with fracture toughness more or less the same between the grains and uh, through the grain. But the, the, the sample was too large for our simulation here. We, we kind of shrank it quite a bit. Instead of 10 centimeters, we went to 2 millimeters, 2.5. Uh, but we kept uh, everything else the same. We wanted to keep the grain size the same because we thought maybe that's kind of important. Uh, and then we hit on the side very similarly to the way they apply that load there with the same stress level. Uh, here is the, the damage map. So the, you know, the, at every point where I compute how many friends I lost, uh, if you lose all of them, you're red in this plot. And then if you lose about half, this kind of a greenish color, that's a crack, right? Um, and uh, the shape of the damage is very similar. You see this arrow had the uh, shape of this damage front. This is fully fragmented, and the same in an experiment. And then uh, the, the extra observation they made in the experiments is that this fragmentation front transitions to individual cracks. And you see these cracks. And they also measure the speed at which these things propagate. The fragmentation front uh, propagates at super shear speed, 8 kilometers per second. Whereas the cracks, once it transitions to the cracks, it goes to four kilometers per half uh, subsonic. Okay? And we measure these uh, things on our simulations, and we get identical results there as well. So that was uh, really good. Um, of course, in our uh, uh, simulations here, you see oh, some, some uh, cracking that happens between the grains. Uh, at this uh, size, you're not going to see that, that clearly. The, uh, the crystal size in this uh, material are about 250 microns or so. Um, this is a cross section. Uh, the explanation why the damage front moves so fast at supersonic, uh, super shear speed, is because uh, uh, we have these details in the paper, but um, there's bouncing from of waves, elastic waves from the surfaces, these finite surfaces of the sample, um, that lead to this wave reinforcement, and that's why that uh, 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 that fragmentation front moves so fast. Once uh, the process loses steam, loses, uh, dissipates enough energy, then it transitions to cracks, and uh, the cracks grow sub Rayleigh wave speed, as kind of expected from, from classical theories. Yeah, so the horizon has to be smaller than the, 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 uh, the grain size here, because otherwise you're not going to see the grains, right? You're averaging more or less. So it's, uh, I forget the detail here, but um, you know, it's, we have a 200 uh, some grains. Um, I, I would say uh, you know, the horizon is maybe a third of a smaller grain, something like that. I, I have to look up in, in the paper. Um, I think we had a few million nodes, though, here um, in, in three dimensions. But I mean, you know, it goes back to my previous question. If you make the horizon big here, there, there can be issues with... <coughs> right, so the wave pr will propagate faster than what you expect, yeah, from a classical model, of course. And physically, too. I mean, right. in general, right. yeah. there is an issue, right? I mean, right, but as you shrink that horizon, uh, then, um, and, and again, it's relative to the, to the sample size because you have these reflections. That's what really matters here in terms of capturing the right uh, waves moving in the sample. We should discuss yes. this, but I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. This is a, what does that say about the model? Yes. Um, if you were to use kind of a similar material properties, but change the structure, the microstructure. Here I, I used the, the one we already did. And here it's kind of a single crystal, but having uh, the properties of one of those crystals you saw before. Or an isotropic with the same bulk modulus, let's say, like the material. Then you, you see the differences, um, some similarities, but also differences in terms of, uh, you know, this is almost like a, I don't know, artichoke, avocado, not a... Uh, uh, 
uh, uh, onion peeling uh, the root of a beet, and then maybe this is a celery root, or I don't know. Um, there we go. Uh, I'm not going to have much time to talk about this, but this is a, a dislocation model. This is just appeared in a journal Plasticity. Uh, so we have um, dislocations, and uh, they're supposed to interact with this growing crack. You see the crack growing here? I'm showing the displacement in the vertical direction only here. And uh, leading to this um, um, undulating crack path, because of the interacting, so the boundary conditions here, I should mention, they are, oh, there it goes. Uh, so this one also grows. Uh, we're just displacement controlled, pulling apart the sample. Um, well, they're not the same. Uh, uh, yeah, this is probably from a different uh, realization of, of a random uh, um, uh, th these, these locations because the crack path is different than in this, uh, this picture. But uh, they see the same thing, right? So uh, it's a little hard to see here. There's some black dots if you come close. These are the same block that we see here, the, the course of the dislocations, and some annihilate, some, uh, some uh, pin themselves. Uh, they, some of them uh, um, annihilate on the boundaries. Um, but I, cannot, I don't have time to talk more about that right now. I want to say a few words about uh, homogenization because these computations are expensive. I, I had to shrink that sample right, to, to get those results, as you saw, if I wanted to model the microstructure. Uh, how about uh, trying something else, right? So um, I could model the microstructure, but that's expensive, and I will get the, the right answer. Or I can uh, maybe um, homogenize, make this a, a paste. Great for elasticity, but we'll see that it doesn't really work for fracture. Uh, is there something in between? Uh, and this is really a stochastic homogenization. Um, and I'll keep just some minor uh, or some, some, uh, some information from the microstructure, but not all. And the information from the microstructure I will keep in this particular example, we did a fracture of a porous rock, is the volume fraction of the pores, uh, the porosity of the, the sample. So here's the model. Um, you have uh, uh, two points in your paradigmic model that have a bond between them. If this is the actual microscale with, uh, let's say it's a composite, a phase A and phase B, uh, you can generate properties for these bonds depending on where that particular center of this region, that uh, uh, material region that this point is responsible for to represent, right? Um, where that falls in phase A or phase B. And based on the volume fractions of the two phases, um, you can basically uh, easily uh, say that uh, the probability for a, a bond connecting these two to have, uh, to be a phase A material uh, comes out with this probability, or to be kind of an interface, has this probability, and so on. Uh, so if you look at the smaller scale uh, in your predynamic model, you, um, for this center point here, I'm just looking at the nearest neighbors, but that the whole thing goes for the, all the bonds in this horizon. Um, and you can have randomly uh, assigned properties to different material properties in your system, uh, as shown in this picture. For porous material, of course, one phase it's basically a void, so you just clip some of those bonds to create the volume fraction that you, you need to, to match uh, given the porosity of the rock. So, um, and in this example, I'll choose a simple uh, failure model. So the elasticity is the, you know, the actual elasticity uh, of the rock, and then uh, the, the spring here breaks at a certain uh, strain. Uh, here's the test we're going to try to validate this against. This is uh, that porous rock. It's a three-point bending, so you apply a load uh, from the top here, and there's a notch. And what happens if the notch is too short in the experiments, the crack grows from the center here, where you have the largest tensile. Yeah, as if you didn't have a notch, really. But if the notch is long enough, the crack grows from the notch. Okay, simple. Uh, with a fully homogenized paradigmic model, the crack always grows from the notch because there's no other defects or anything else going on there, right? Here, where the maximum strain is, uh, axial stress is, is uh, showing up, there's no defects there. Um, but in this intermediate homogenized model, I already clipped some of the bonds to create the material to match the volume fraction of that uh, rock. And uh, you see here sort of the pre-damage, right? So the, how many bonds I have to break for each point 
on average, right, so it gives me this kind of a color. So maybe 70% to match, I forget, maybe a 30% porosity for this rock, what, what it was. And in this case, you, uh, then this is after the, the final uh, picture, um, the long notch cracks from the notch, the, the short notch cracks from the base of the, the plate. Here's the, the simulation. Uh, these are, again, quasi-static uh, solution because it's, uh, the experiment is also kind of quasi-static. You just apply a displacement load, weight, apply, okay? So uh, these red dots here are acoustic emission data measured. And you see we're, we're tracking pretty well where our damage is, where we actually break the bonds, even though it's quasi-static, right? And the acoustic emission, it's really some, some ways, yeah. But they, what they do is uh, they, they give you the signature where material broke, where it cracked, where material failed. Um, same model, and now if you want to look at corrosion-induced fracture here, we just um, simulated or mimic corrosion because if you have this rebar in the cross-section of your um, uh, concrete slab and then there's uh, chlorides getting in, the rust will expand. The, the volume of the uh, oxides is, is higher there, so you get basically a displacement controlled condition there pushing up on the, on the top of this uh, uh, rebar. The fully homogenized model gives you the wrong fracture mechanism. Uh, why am I saying that? Because in the experiments, this vertical crack starts from the top. They notice that. And you see here, the, the one that's the stochastic one also starts from the top right here, whereas this one starts from the, the vertical cracks that we'll, we will start from here. Um, and you, you see why this should start from the, the bottom. Once it cracked here, because of your continuous pushing, this displacement boundary condition here, you're gonna bend upward. So it has to, to crack somewhere there, and it does. Um, this is if you have three such uh, uh, rebars in the experiment, they see, see two vertical cracks, not for the third one. And then if I change the real, realization of my microstructure, uh, the results are pretty consistent. Yes? What's the loading? What's what? Loading. The loading is simply uh, a displacement condition on, on this uh, region that just grows. Okay? So just pushing, mimicking the push from the, there's no other, no other loading. So it's a displacement controlled on the tops of this, uh, as, as shown here. And that's because we know how corrosion evolves. People looked at these things and then they tried to approximate that, um, that, that, that type of loading. Yeah. So you apply a boundary condition of displacement? Yes, yeah, yeah. And uh, the roads? That grows in time. And the roads do not deform? Yes, uh, well, it's still, it's not gonna break. Uh, the, the concrete is weak in, in tension, so that's why it just gives up, yeah. No, no, but what I mean is <coughs> roads may deform. I mean, you can increase yeah. the deformation of the roads or apply it. Yeah, um, no, here I don't think we even model that. Um, but uh, as you can see, it's not that critical in a sense. Uh, yeah, again, because the, the reason for that is the concrete is so weak in Tension. It's good in compression, but not in tension. Um, so uh, again, here what I try to do is to retain some relevant information from the micro scale that will help me with this homogenization, uh, stochastic, yeah, to, to uh, do fracture without having to model the detailed microstructure. Okay? And the cost, therefore, except for when you generate the microstructure, is identical to the one for the fully homogenized. So this is where you reduce the, the order of the model uh, by this. Um, we, we try this for concrete. This is a very difficult problem of what's called the anchor pullout. You, you have a steel bar. Uh, here we model the steel as an elastic material as well, but again, it doesn't break. So you pull on this anchor, um, and then you, it cracks in this way. This is an experimental uh, picture here. What's interesting, even though the bonds themselves follow here a linear with brittle failure, the overall behavior is linear with softening, which is matching very well what, what they do see in the experiments. Okay? And um, interestingly enough, uh, as we change these uh, realizations of different microstructures, we capture what they see in experiments. Sometimes this crack leans left, sometimes the crack leans right, and a few times if they, <laughs> Uh, put it really symmetrical for the experimental conditions, it, uh, it's pretty symmetrical as well. So we, we get, uh, and we did about 20 here, and then we got uh, you know, some of them uh, left, most of them left for some unknown reason. 
Some of them right, uh, and then some symmetric as well. Um, yeah, so this is, by the way, some, some work done on this. Uh, you can do this for, for uh, fiber reinforced composites as well. It works very well. Um, how much time do I have? A few minutes. So I'm going to skip this, but if you want to know about uh, bad roads, uh, talk to me. Uh, I will have an explanation for that. We can predict. Uh, um, this is uh, as these things dry up. The, the concrete actually cracks almost in you know, a few days before you put any load on it. And uh, the problem is that if it cracks, uh, some of these cracks may show up close to one another, and then they connect here, and then you have this pop out and you get a pothole. And we can actually predict this type of behavior. And we can tell. Give me the, the temperature profile over the next five days and the humidity, and I can tell you how far apart you should put these pre-cracks so then it doesn't cause cracks to, to be too close to one another. Right? So if you put them here, there will be no more extra cracks. Um, if you put them just here, with this spacing, there will be extra cracks. And when you have extra cracks, they, you can have the ones, it's hard to see here, but there's two of them very near one another. So this is really, really exciting. Um, normal homologs are expensive, um, and you could couple them with local models, but that's kind of a mess and creates its own complications. Let's try to exploit the convolutional structure of the peridynamic integral operators, which can, uh, can help us. And this is the MATLAB code that I mentioned for the, with us two, two simple examples. So uh, these are the, the dynamic equation, right? And then you discretize with this mesh free, you call it, so just... Uh, uh, kind of a Riemann sum uh, addition here uh, of contributions of forces on every point, sum them up. You can do a finite element discretization for peridynamic solutions. There's no reason to, to not do that unless you want to model fracture, of course. Um, but uh, the problem is that if you have, in three dimensions, you could have a thousand nodes for every, a thousand friends for every node. Uh, so that's going to lead uh, to a, a really costly calculation. So uh, rather than computing that integral with the Gaussian integration, one point Gaussian integration or the, the quadrature, we compute it with the, um, with the FFT. So we use a convolution theorem, as long as you can write your kernel as a convolution. And we'll see that you can do that in quite a few cases. So there's some papers here we published on uh, diffusion, uh, elasticity, and even fracture. So um, you can uh, create a periodic box. This is my domain now. Um, there are masking functions to tell you where the domain is uh, and the boundary conditions. So to account for that, there's not a, a problem. And you can use this um, uh, really for a, a, a pretty general case. And we've done this uh, for uh, bond-based models, paradynamic models, the state-based model. These are models that don't have the Poisson restriction. Some of the models that I showed you the results with um, are pairwise interactions. They will give you a fixed Poisson ratio. But there's a, a more general uh, state-based model that, uh, that uh, allows you to do this uh, without any trouble. And then this comes, you can write it in a convolutional form in this way. And then you just dump it to uh, discrete finite uh, uh, fast Fourier transform and bring it back with uh, the inverse one. And it's going to scale much better than, uh, than anything. There's also a paradigmic correspondence model. If you have legacy constitutive models like plasticity of various kinds that use deformation gradients in their formulation, uh, then you can uh, come up with a, a, a way to transfer that into your paradynamic model. It will lead to some instabilities, but those things can be resolved relatively easily. Uh, so you can have a convolution structure th there as well. So for plasticity, that's what we use. And this is for, um, uh, you gain a factor of 1,000, basically. Instead of you know, months, you can solve in hours now. Um, if you try, that was elasticity, if you have um, fracture, the, the, this bond stretch uh, criterion doesn't really look, uh, work well, so you have to um, do it uh, kind of an energy-based criterion, kind of a local quantity for damage, and then you can, we were able to find the, the convolutional structure. These are results with the different, with the old mesh-free discretization method. These are with this FCBM, fast convolution-based method. Uh, for different loads, uh, stress uh, values, you get the same crack pattern here. Um, and, and that's the dynamic simulation there, uh, the velocity uh, components, displacements, and the strain energy and, and damage in two dimensions. But now, because this is fast, I can do it in three dimensions. Uh, 
the, like the one you saw the, at, the, at the beginning, right? So this is a uh, you know, few million nodes uh, and close to 10 uh, million degrees of freedom. Uh, this is, with the correspondence model, uh, you can do a plasticity. Mm. This is supposed to break uh, in a, it's a big hole in a, yeah, it's not gonna play, I guess. Um, since we are at IPAM and this is pure in applied mathematics, we also have analytical solutions for these non-local equations, the dynamic ones, transient diffusion and elastodynamics, uh, 1D, 2D, uh, with, similarly you can do it in 3D. We use the classical way people solve PDEs in a simple domains with separation of variables. For instance, you find series solutions. Very, very similar, you just have to patch in a, a non-local factor, we call it, and the solution looks almost identical to the classical ones. Uh, and this is some interesting kind of passing, uh, this is just a wave in one dimension, this is phase plane for that. Um, uh, it looks to me as if you increase the horizon size relative to the size of your elastic bar, you almost get into chaos. Uh, I did, we didn't explore this deeper, but um, I think it's worth looking into. Now let me finish with this. Um, so we have a, a text uh, a few years ago up here the, on paradigmatic modeling. There's something to, uh, will show up this end of this year, hopefully, on corrosion damage. And I'm gonna be offering with our friends in uh, Padova in Italy a, um, a short course. Uh, it's in, on the events, not a short course, because we have it for four days instead of five, usual, that they have uh, during this time. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>